Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Josh and Jason Monday Christian and Conspiracy Podcast Show. I am your host, Josh Monday. If you don't know me, I'm a Christian rapper, devoted husband, father, and army veteran. I'd like to introduce you to my co-host, a Christian, devoted husband, and father. What's up, Jason? How's it going? And my brother, Jason. What's up? Good morning. What's up, man? How you doing? How's it going, Matt? Uh, pleasure to meet you, uh, Josh. Always a pleasure. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Um, okay, so. <laughs> So today we yeah. have a, a very special guest. Uh, finally got to track him down. I've been asking Dave Weiss, his, uh, his co-host, uh, for his information for a long time, and 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 he's back in the game. So uh, we are definitely glad to introduce you guys to Matt Long. How's it going, my brother? Man, I appreciate it. In many places I go, I'm just introduced as Dave Weiss's friend. So I appreciate it. No way. Hey, see, Dave Weiss, every time he comes on my show, he's like, you have to be the science side. My friend Matt is the biblical side. But hey, dude, I like the biblical side, bro. As long as the Bible says it for me, I believe it's absolute truth. That's my foundation. And I, science, whatever. But when he starts, but he has a great, he does a great job, definitely. of. Uh, it, of Dave's being. awesome. And I appreciate the science, but I got tired of chasing that a long time ago. When I found out the Bible was true and the word of God, I just said, you know what? I'm going to start here from now on. Yes, yes. And and all these conspiracy uh, shows that I hop on are all these different ones that are not biblical. What happens is they have all these rabbit holes they go through, but they never have the answer at the bottom of the hole. But but that's the thing. Whenever you, you know, you become Christian, you know that the answer is Jesus. We have the way, the truth, the life. So before amen. we start, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I just said amen. Oh, amen. All right, let's go. All right. Before we start, I always like to kind of get into this. So uh, first of all, uh, whenever I talk about flat earth, I like to definitely introduce, like, or I'll let people know that, that faith comes by hearing the word of God. That's Romans 10, 17. So it says, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God, by a say, have you not heard? Yes, verily their, their sound went into all the earth and their words unto the ends of the world. So faith comes by hearing. So as we're going over these, uh, these Bible verses, understand that, that faith is going to come by hearing the word of God. So and 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 when Paul was uh you know speaking, um he's he's he, you know the Old Testament was available. So what I like to also tell you guys is uh, Paul says in, in that Second Timothy three sixteen uh he says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Okay, so you guys got to understand that. So all Scripture. Okay, so. When we're talking about Genesis, Isaiah, all these different verses that we're going to be going over, understand that it's inspired by God, okay? And I believe the, the New Testament is also inspired by God, too, you know? So, and then uh, another one I always like to go over, uh, uh, 1 Timothy 6.20, it says, O oh, Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoid profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science, falsely so-called, which is professing and have erred concerning the faith. Grace be with thee. Amen. The first of Timothy was written from Laodicea, which is the cheapest city of Figeria, uh, Pasitania. So we got to understand that there's going to be science that comes out that's going to test our faith. OK, we got to make sure that we are grounded in the word and we know, you know, to to be able to um, to go against some of the science, the stuff that's testable, repeatable, provable. That's that's a different story. You know, I don't see the Bible going against that stuff, but a lot of the stuff that are theories I see the Bible is definitely combating these these things, and um, we are going to be speaking of that today. Um, did you have any verses you want to go over first, Matt, before we just jump in? No, I was just going to, one, you speak like a rapper, so it's, <laughs> <but> sorry. <laughs> you, you talked about faith by hearing, right? And the amazing thing is this place was created by God speaking, right? And Romans one twenty says that we can get to know the attributes of God by the things that were made, by the things that were spoken into existence. So I think it's very important to know where we are, know what we are, know what God created. And to, to speak these things also gives honor to it. So if we, if we are going to uh, acknowledge God's creation, to speak about it, we're actually also speaking against the lies, right? So every time we talk about this, it is it's our counterattack to the things that have been spoken into existence that are that are not true. So very important. Yeah, and as we know, Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. So truth is very important. So we got to make sure we we, we don't. And, and the creation is just is enough to condemn you if you don't believe in the creation. That is just enough to condemn you. Yep, Romans one twenty. <laughs> yeah. 
which is awesome. That's that's a great verse. I actually have Romans one twenty right here too. I probably got it maybe from one of your shows. I don't, I'm it, not sure. It's <laughs> funny you guys are going through Romans because I've been studying Romans this last few weeks, and it's uh, it's a pretty, it's a pretty uh, pretty good book. It's it's uh, scary to read. There's uh, there's a lot in there that could. There's no excuses after you read that book. It's it's like there is no excuse. There's it's yeah. it's very informative. It's very 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 well written, elegantly written by Paul, and it's very. Uh, I told my boy, I was like, I kind of I can't even get past chapter four right now because it's so. <laughs> it's so uh it's it's so crazy it's it's good yeah so yeah so romans 120 if you start at 19 it says for what may be known about god is clear since god has shown it to them the invisible things his eternal power his deity have been clearly seen since the creation of the world and can be understood by the things that are made so that they are without excuse there we go yeah so if you if you're you know taught a lie the whole time that's what happens a big brick wall gets put up between each brick wall gets put up, and then once you finally go back to reading the Bible after after all the stuff you've learned in college, it keeps just you have to keep breaking all these brick walls down to finally understand the Word of God. So that's well, I've definitely- heard I've heard Crow Triple Seven put it in a fashion, and I know we'll, we'll get into this, but he says that the devil cannot rule the creation that God made, so he has to create his own. He has to mm. create this fictitious one that he pulls in front of our eyes, and he can rule that one. He can rule that lie. He's the father of lies. So again, that's why it's so important to pull back this, pull back this curtain and see, see what we're actually living on. Definitely. So as a Christian, I always say this too, man, we should filter science through the Bible, not filter the Bible through science. So let's make sure we know that we're grounded in the word and that God's word. We we always say this, you know, or the Bible says it, sorry, let God be truth and every man a liar. Okay. We got to make sure we understand that. So as we go through and uh, we'll start out first. Uh, we can kind of go over like what scientists say, you know, and then we could, we could hit like, I'll, I'll tell you what scientists say. And then we could go right to what, what does the Bible say? You know, I think this is gonna be like a science versus the Bible type episode. So, um, so it says that the earth is on a 23.4 degree axis, uh, spinning at a thousand miles an hour and orbiting the sun at 66,600 miles an hour, which is definitely a, um, a, uh, you know, interesting number to have. So th- I just want to let you guys know, first of all, that the fastest bullet, uh, it travels 1,800 miles per hour, okay? So they're saying that we're basically orbiting at 30 times faster than a bullet, okay? You guys got to understand that, you know, go outside, you know, uh, and 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 see what you feel. Do you feel us moving anything of the sort? You know, obviously, I don't feel that we are, so anything that we could perceive, uh, we're not seeing that at all. So let's see what the Bible says. So it says we're orbiting, we're moving, we're spinning. Um, what does the Bible say about uh, us, about the earth, right? Um, so I, do you want to start off or do you want me to start off, Matt? Sure. Well, I was just saying the Bible multiple times in multiple places talks about the earth being fixed and immovable. And that's, you know, the characteristics of a spinning ball would be something that is moving. And quite obviously in the Bible, all over the place, says fixed and movable it's established it's on a foundation it's on pillars and yeah i I assume you'd want to touch on some of that stuff yeah so first chronicles 16 30 says he has fixed the earth immovable psalms 93 1 thou hast fixed the earth immovable and firm psalms 96 10 he has fixed the earth firm and immovable psalms 104 5 thou fixed the earth on its foundations so it could never be shaken okay uh isaiah 45 18 who made the earth and fashioned it himself fixed it fast and then Isaiah 48, 13, mine hand has also laid the foundation of the earth and my right hand hath spanned the heavens when I call unto them and stand together. So that's, that is like, it's basically all those verses are, are backing that up. And uh, I think another one that we could probably touch on is that, um, uh, you know, in the beginning, God created the, the heavens and the land right on day one, uh, Day two was the oceans and the firmament. Day three was the dry land, plants, and vegetation. So we have what I have, what I believe is day one, the land, which is earth, right, was created, which I believe he created the foundations of the earth. In Job, it says that the angels were were cheering, right? So the angels were created already. Um, it says that that he created the heavens, the Shemaim, which is the heavens, right? It's plural. So I believe he created the sky, right? I believe he created where he, where we, where he was going to place the moon, sun, and the stars. And then I believe that he created the heavens where, where his throne would be located. And then uh, on day two, uh, the oceans. So there's basically 
there's going to be water. Uh, you know what? I'm sorry. Day two was not oceans. It was just he separated the water from the water. So he hasn't created the oceans yet. Day three is when the oceans, the plant, land, and vegetation was was created. So it looks like the continents came up. And uh, so I that's that's the way I believe the Bible is is laid out. And it wasn't until day four that he created the moon, sun, and the stars also. So the way that the order of that is also something that contradicts what science says, because science is talking about um, the stars coming first, right? So that's like, it's just like a movie, the backdrop. So they got the stars coming first, like 13 billion years ago. And then it says the moon was next. Actually, the moon is just a rock. And 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 then it says that the, the sun was formed 4.6 4 billion years ago. And then 4.5 billion year, years ago, the earth was formed and then the other planets, right? So we have, uh, that's another contradiction. So God looks like he's laying out the earth, which is made for us. You know, we're special. And and the moon, sun, and the stars, which is the greater light to rule the day, lesser light to rule the night. And the stars also are, are lights for the earth, right? That's what it, it says. It's lights, signs, seasons for us. You know, it, the Bible is, is making something special for us, a home for us, right? Uh, totally different than, than what science says, but. You know, even the order, right, Matt? Would you agree with that? That, yeah. Well, <clears throat> I think first of all, I think Christians who understand that other sciences are attack on Christianity, I think they can appreciate the fact that in most cases, science likes to go in the direct opposite of whatever the Bible says. And so, this is just another one of those examples that we're laying out for you where science has decided to take the complete opposite route in order to disprove page one of the Bible. Because if you can disprove page one, there's no point in reading page two. There's no point in reading on. Some of the things you touched on, the 23.4 degree tilt, that's actually, that's also 66.6 .6 degrees taken out of 90, right? Taken yep. out of a right angle. I know that over 70 times the Bible talks about the sun, moon, and stars as moving, and not once talks about the earth as moving. The, the whole... This whole solar system, this whole idea that the earth is revolving around the sun, it all goes back to the Big Bang. It all goes back to the point where nothing exploded and created everything without the help of an all-loving, all-powerful creator. And, the, and this is what leads to the, the, the very old age of the sun, the very old age of the earth, the very old age of the moon. And yes, of course, they're going to say that the sun and moon were created before the earth. Because the Bible clearly says that the earth, the land, was created before the sun. And something that's also interesting is that we had morning and evening before the sun was even created. So I, I think yeah. that morning and even might even go back to the light that was created on day one, which is which is very interesting. And, very, and I actually believe very. and I actually believe that the the sun is is just a resultant of the previous three days, because I think the sun is a focal image from the light that was created on day one. So you have light on day one, the firmament on day two, which is the lens, okay? And then you, on day three, you've got the plants, which create our atmosphere, the air and, and the magnification, all that stuff. And so on day four, when the sun shows up, I think it's I think it's this kind of obvious resultant of all these things that's been created. I think it's very logical. I think it's way more logical than nothing exploded and created everything billions of years ago. And then our solar system has turned itself into this perfect little clock, you know? Mm -hmm. That, that was wound up. And by the way, it didn't start like that. It had to end up like that. And now it's just in this perfect like equilibrium and it never changes. You know, it's it's crazy. Yes, I, I definitely agree. And the Big Bang that uh, you were speaking of uh, is George Lamontre uh, uh, back in, uh, I think it was like the, the 1920s, right? He's, he's a Belgium cosmologist, Catholic priest, uh, Jesuit trained priest, you know, so we got Jesuits in there. So you know, everybody that we're going to be speaking about as far as back in the day, you're going to find that a cultist, uh, you know, or or they, they when they when they talk about like Copernicus, for example, he says that the sun is enthroned like 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 it's a god. Right. And everything is revolving around it, you know, heliocentric. Right. So that they, they are. Uh, and even though you might find like, oh, this guy was a priest. Oh, this guy was a lot of the times they, they they talk about um certain ones of these guys, you know, being a priest or being like, oh, they were Christian, you know. Uh, but then you're mm -hmm. gonna find a cult uh in, in their writings and a cult uh type stuff in their in their, you know, being a Jesuit trained priest. You hear Jesuit as a conspiracy theorist, immediately you know that that's a red flag, right? So 
Um, yeah, so that's interesting. And then evolution is another thing that's good, that they need because they need a long period of time. So the Big Bang mixed with evolution, they need that long, you know, 13.8 billion years of, of everything like creating itself naturalistic, right, without God. So they need that long time for that to happen. And uh, obviously the Bible does not line up with a 13.8 billion year, uh, you know, span. Uh, Jason, anything? Yeah, that? What's, well, so while we're still, well, I'm gonna stick with Romans still again. So Romans one twenty five, where this is where I feel like our problems are starting to exist today. With, you know, there's a lot of things. If anybody in this this table will agree that there's a lot of vile affection going on in this world today, which is, it's one twenty five says, who changed the truth of God into a lie? Who did that? The devil. Satan, our adversary, he changed into a lie. So now if who worships and serve the create the creature more than the creator. So basically God's telling you that you want to worship the cre the creature. Fine. I'll turn you over to that. You want to worship this, these type of things. I'll turn you into a vile, a vile affection where women will lay with women and men will lay with men. And it'll turn the whole natural order of life into something that's not even, it's an abomination. So I feel like that when, What's going on today when you when you push this lie, whether it's flat earth, I don't know what it is. I'm not I, I can't say if it's flat. I can't say I, I just know it's not a globe. I don't I know I feel like that the I feel like we're I'm a geocentric type of person where I feel like everything does revolve around us because we are God did make it to where we're supposed to be very important. And when you don't think that way, you just feel like yourself as a number. And you feel like you're not important, and then you start to understand, start to believe that hey, maybe there, maybe there isn't a god, maybe the creation is more important than the creator. And when you do that, there's a lot of put, there's there's judgments and punishments that come with this to your nation that will that'll fall under the fact that what's going on in our country right now, everybody denies the fact that there's a creator. There's they want to they want to play themselves as god. They, there's there's high rates of abortion, which is which is very very I feel like is very very horrible. And then you got, you know, these, these, this stuff going on with transgenderism and, and very, very, very prideful stuff going on. And what is the, that's the most, I feel like that God is, is that's the most worst sin of all is pride because pride leads to everything else. It's, and it's this, it's, it's weird how it's laid out. The Bible has foretold every religion, every everything in advance to show you hey this is what happens when you worship this this is what happens when you give yourself over to these type of idols and when people don't they put down the bible because they don't read it they don't they don't want to understand it they don't want to know that stuff they want to they just want to stay in that dark area where it's the gray area where like oh man if it doesn't really affect me directly then i don't really have to really really have to pursue it and i feel like when you start going through the bible it shows you there's it shows you about you know these type of religions, these idol worshiping type of things, the, the pagan man, the religious man, the moral man, all these things that you have out there, that that none of it's right. You're, there is no, there is no, there is no. Uh, uh, every heart is evil at, at, at its core. Oh, so to 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 worship the creature more than the creator is is is. But that's that's why I feel like that's why our nation is turning into. What is turning into today because we have given ourselves over to this stuff and god's well god will let you do it you want to make that choice go ahead but you're gonna there's 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 repercussions and 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 there's a reaction for every, there's oh. every action so yes i don't know that's I, that's why i've been studying romans that's why i'm like wow it shows you every little thing that goes on when you mess up or do something there's a there's a there's a there's a nice little judgment for you and and for your nation and i feel like we have to pray so much harder now it's more difficult now these days to to even believe something that as 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 beautiful as the Bible and as spiritual it is, it's so much more difficult to even dive into it because I can just flip on the television and just take my mind off of whatever that's supposed to be I'm supposed to be really be supposed to be doing, which is teaching my family about this and and bringing them up into speed to where they're they're learning like I want my yeah. son and my daughter and my 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 other my other kids to 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 follow that suit it's very hard when they're being dumbed down by youtube and dumbed down by cartoons and and stuff that's just breaking their childhood into desensitizing them into thinking hey man oh it's okay to do this stuff it's okay to do this stuff it's it's really not it's really not and it's very evil and it's it's probably the most evilest thing you could possibly do at its core 
is to mess with a child's mind like this. Yep. And it starts and 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 that's why you know Matt and, and and us we're trying to basically expose the lies so that we can we can definitely raise kids up to once they do pick up the Bible then they could they could they can understand it, you know, and not just have all this stuff going against it because what happens is uh you know Genesis they'll say is like an allegory or Psalms is just a, a poem and Job is just poetry. This is not stuff you should take literal. So then they just take that part of the Bible and they put it to the side. But um, even yeah, Jesus- I was right, just going to say that's that's the only thing you can do when you actually start to read these verses. If you've been influenced by the world that Jason was talking about, the the TV that's that's part of the world that the devil has pulled over our face. It's part of the thing that he uses to confuse us and. He talked about pride leading to these things. And in my opinion, the the false creation is what leads to the ability to think that maybe God's not here. You know, just for clarity, we we don't believe in a solar system. We don't believe in an earth spinning, you know, in a, a flat earth spinning in a solar system that you could sail off of, you know, fall off the edge and, you know, amid these other planets that are around no we think earth is all there is we believe in an earth system a a deal well at least at least i do we i believe in an earth system where there's a dome over us it's like a snow globe where the sun moon and stars are smaller closer placed inside this mm-hmm. and it, it's like the truman show like we are here and if people knew that that's where we were there would be a significant percentage of the population that would have to turn from their ways there's there's no getting around that this place was created as opposed to the uh you know ever expanding potentially infinite universe model that people say was created without without a god so <laughs> yeah and big bang i mean I, you know i was in the army so we have to we have to like watch several movies on explosions if the you know the explosion i've always seen it explode and not create anything so they want us to to believe that an explosion happened and created where everything came together. I never seen it. So. Like it's said the firmament, Josh. Like so if like people discovered the firmament, like like Matt says, it would flip the script a hundred percent. I'm like, okay, well, that's in the scripture. How the heck did they know that back then? How did he- how did they know scientifically that there was a a rakia over us that that's that's hard and 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 it basically, you know, it, it, that would that would really probably melt some people's brains. They'd be like, oh my gosh, like I've been learning this way and this is what it really is. Then cycli- the Cyclopedia Britannica back in the 1950s was actually right. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like this is, they've changed their, they changed their script so much. Oh, it's, it's 29,000 years old. It's billions of years old. It's thousands of years old. It's like, dude, it's, it doesn't matter. That part doesn't matter. The, 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 the firmament shows his handiwork. It's, it's in, it's in there so many times, but no, 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 no church really goes, goes and touches on this. You go to church and you have a pastor about the firm. He's like, Hey dude, uh, yeah, yeah. Nope. That's so, let's move along. You know, like don't, don't go to that. It's like, they it's say weird. it's a, what they'll say is like, it's a canopy. That's the first thing that I've heard. Uh, so they'll, they'll talk up and that's like a Ken Hovind theory where it's a canopy around mm-hmm. the earth. But what they don't understand is like Matt said, they put the moon, God put the moon, sun and the stars in the firmament. So that canopy would have to be outside of the entire universe for it to be a canopy. So there's not two firmaments, one firmament. And, uh, also I want to go over this real quick in numbers 12. I got this from one of my listeners. Uh, it says, I'll just read the whole thing. It's 12, four through eight. And this is God speaking to Aaron and, and Miriam, okay? He says, and the Lord spoke uh, suddenly unto Moses and unto Aaron and unto Miriam, come out thee under the tabernacle of the congregation. And and they all three came out. And the Lord came down in the pillar of the cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam. And they both came forth and he said, hear now my words. If there are a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto them in him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream right so that's that's the way he spoke to ezekiel isaiah right but my servant moses is not so who is faithful in all mine house when i speak with him i speak to him mouth to mouth even apparently not in dark speeches and in sim, sim, similitude of the lord he shall behold 
Where have ye not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? What I'm saying is when he spoke to Moses on, on Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights and gave him Genesis and gave him, he spoke to him mouth to mouth. So this, this is like when we sp speak about Genesis, like we were talking about, where um, I could go over what Matt was speaking of and, and uh, Jason about the firmament. When, when he says, and God said, let there be lights in the firmament of heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs, for seasons and for days and for years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of heaven to give a light upon the earth. And it was so, and God made two great lights. That's also another thing that contradicts science. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, less light to rule the night. He made the stars also, like it's no big deal. Separating what a sun is, from what a star is, is also something that God does there that, that science does not. They say that the sun is a star, right? Um, and he made the stars also. And it says, and God set them in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth and uh, and the rule over the day and over the night to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. So when God is speaking to Moses right there, he's speaking to a mouth to mouth. All right. So you guys, this is not allegorical, anything like that. So understand that that I when she sent that to me and I was like, man, I, I didn't even pick that up when I read that, you know, so very interesting. Yeah, now, that's awesome. Now, when did you start? When did when did like when did you really start putting these pieces together? Because I know you've been on with Dave Weiss. Dave Weiss has a lot of information and he's and he's and he's uh, very scientific about that part. But when did you start going, hey, you know what? Like, like at what age and, and, and like, what, where did you start to say, you know what, I'm going to follow this sure. and go this. Sure. Back in 2015 was the first time I'd heard about flat earth. I mean, and it's the first time I'd heard it properly laid out to me before that. I, um, a few years before I kind of started, I started reading the Bible for the first time in my life and started seeing like, Hey, you know, this thing talks about giants in Genesis six. It talks about the earth being thousands of years old, not billions of years old. It talks about kinds being produced after their own kind so that evolution couldn't be true. And so I had this big uh, switch that was flipped and I started to realize through investigating Answers in Genesis, Institute of Creation Research, that these groups actually had better explanations for how everything got here than science did. And I, that's science with a capital S because these groups do use a scientific method and, and logic and I I decided around that time, this was probably like 2010, 2012, that, okay, the Bible is my truth. I'm going to start here with everything. And, and in 2015, I was watching a video that I didn't know was about flat earth. I thought it was about the Nephilim, which was the giants in Genesis 6. And he starts talking about flat earth and how he heard about it and how the map of the United Nations was the map of the flat earth and how you can still circumnavigate the flat earth and how you're not going to fall off the edge and how sunrise and sunset can still work perfectly the way, the way we see them. And then he started talking about the scriptures and man, I knew the scriptures because Genesis one through 11, that was my gravy. That, that was, that's like 2000 years of world history crammed into like 11 pages <laughs> yeah. of, of the Bible. And it's, it's the coolest stories. It's, it's the creation account. It's, <clears throat> it's Noah, it's tower of Babel. It's the giants in Genesis six, it's really cool stuff. And, yeah. and I say in my book, like I started to realize the the history of this place was a lot closer to Lord of the Rings and planet of the apes. Yeah. And <laughs> it was, it was like, I was reading it for the first time and seeing that, Hey, there's a lot of stuff in here that we don't talk about in church. And there's a lot of things in here that people don't want to talk about. Like you talk about the canopy theory, the, the ice canopy, which, you know, it, the the firmament is holding up the waters above like it plainly says in genesis and yeah. and david still talks about the waters above in psalms which is after the flood so the canopy theory for christians in my mind you know doesn't work they they like to say that the firmament is this empty expanse when in job i believe it, it, he calls it as molten looking glass you know that and, and rakia like like jason said that like that is the idea of pounding out metal so it is not this empty expanse that, that the birds fly in. And then, um, you know, talking about the great lights, uh, it, it says great lights, plural, just like you said, two lights. Two and great so, lights, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, science would tell you that the moon is not a light. It's just reflecting the light of the sun. And 
that that's actually not the case. And you see Matthew 24, he talks about the moon will not give her light. Yes. And, and you, that's easily testable, you know, when, and the next step in my journey was, was doing tests. Uh, one of the tests I did was testing the temperature of moonlight. Moonlight is cold as opposed to sunlight, which is hot. And, and how you can test that is at night. So think about during the day, the sun's out, you stand in it, it's hot. You go in the shade, it gets cooler. Well, at night, if you go in the shade, it actually gets warmer. And that's because moonlight is cold. And you can take a laser thermometer and test that, test the temperature of the ground where the moonlight is shining on and where it's not. And the ground will actually be warmer where the moon is not shining. And, and that shows that it's not reflecting the light of the sun. It's, it's, it's producing its own light. And I also did a, I also went out and did a, uh, a test where it was a very clear, cold, kind of winter day. And I shot my camera up at the, at the sun at noon. And I shot my camera at the sun as it was setting at 6 PM. And normally when the sun sets it, you get a little bit of magnification because it's, you're looking through more atmosphere than you would be when you're looking at it straight up. And if we're on a ball, I thought, eh, the sun should be roughly the same size. If we're on the flat earth and the sun's actually traveling away from us, it should be smaller. And man, to my uh, astonishment, it was actually like 35% smaller. And uh, when I measured it at 6 p.m. And, and that was all just to make sure I wasn't crazy. To answer Jason's question, <laughs> I saw that video and the guy started talking about Bible verses and it was like it hit me immediately. Like I'm listening to truth. This is astonishing, and I, I got to start looking into this. So I spent a couple of years looking into it just to make sure I wasn't crazy, and then and then I couldn't stop talking about it. Amen. Yeah. And how, how, do, how do they know a lesser light? When you read it in the Bible, it says a lesser light, which means it's less hot, less heat, le less light is given off, and that's – how would they know that? It's like scientifically proven. You're, you're going to say that these guys were just not uh, – basically uh, very primitive and probably close to baby cavemen is like barely even know what's going on but these guys were smart and if the if the if someone's writing this two thousand years ago on a on on some papaya leaf or whatever you're gonna be like wow a lesser light oh that's kind of <laughs> you know what i mean why are they using that type of verbiage to say something about something that's like in job there's a whole bunch of scientific stuff that 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 god even says about to 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 uh to job about stuff like he's like say like, why don't you guys tell me what went on you tell me what 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 how i made it because you weren't there nobody was there i was there i know how it started so if, if you know stand up and tell me <clears throat> it's kind of yeah. it's it's it, it blows my mind when people want to put down the bible and say oh it's just a tool to control you and, and make you this way but you send your children to school every day and they're indoctrinated with this with this crap these lies and then they come back and they regurgitate it to you like it's some kind of like it's fact and when you read show them the bible they're like it's like saying santa claus is real your whole life and then you finally finally you think they're not going to believe anything anymore because they're not, they're not if you if you base them off this right off the bat and then they go to school they're like no that's not true sorry that's not what it says in my my book that's been for two thousand years old and you just wrote this like maybe six months ago I'm not going to believe that the kids yeah. would be a lot stronger in their minds. And, and me, when I, when I started studying this and Josh brought this, to, I kept bringing this towards the flatter, flatter, <laughs> flatter, flatter, but I'm like, I don't know if it's flat. Like I said, I just know it's not a globe. It's not a, it's not uh it's not held together by, by all this gravity space. I always, I get, I get ridden by my father-in-law, other people around. They call me crazy. Like, Oh, there's no such thing as planets. I'm like, I don't know, but it's not what they say it is. It's not this. I feel like it's not that. And and they're like, oh, you're insane. Even my son, he checked me on this stuff. He's like, oh, so you're saying that there's no, there's no, there's no planets. I said, look, man, Saturn, Venus, Mars, these are all gods that they have shown that they that that, that you get to recognize. And what do you do with 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 it? You look up. And you give them your, you, all you're doing is looking up and giving them your praise. You're, you're basically kind of worshiping them in a small form. And you don't even know it when you even say their names, when you, when you, you even mention their, the fact that they're even real, they're not, they're not there. It's not yeah, there. So, so planets are, are uh, 
you know, wandering stars, you know, so that that's what it, and then, and it's also planet in the Greek, it, it means to deceive, right? So that's what we're seeing is, is, is people being obviously deceived. Um, and then also like John 5, 45 through 47, this is Jesus speaking after he resurrected, came to speak to, uh, you know, he says, do you think that I have, I accuse you to the father? There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. For if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? So he, that's, it's very important. So uh, Moses, right? Jesus is saying Moses, right? Because Jesus knows that God spoke to him mouth to mouth, right? And and everything that he that God had exposed to him. Because Moses was not alive during Genesis one was not alive during Joseph wasn't alive during Abraham wasn't alive. So what does it have to be a first count first hand account from God, Adam and Eve first hand account from God, the creation of the earth first hand account from God and all these scientists and everybody that are going against the Bible. Like Jason said, that's what God would say to you. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? That's what was happened on day one, the foundations of the earth, right? It, that's how he would check them. So, now you brought up a, a few things, uh, Matt. Uh, one of them would would be that the the moon and the sun are moving, right? Um, also in the Hebrew, this is from Rob Skiba. I I haven't got a chance to to study this part, but Rob Skiba says when it talks about the sun going down in the Hebrew, it means going away from you and not going down, right? So I'm gonna read a few verses here that I'm I'm sure Matt already knows about, um, and I and and I'm going to go over these real quick, so. Um, now the science does say that the moon is orbiting at 2,800 miles an hour, right? So that's going to be faster than our 2,300, I believe faster than a bullet. They say that the moon is rotating around us. Keep in mind that a bullet, the fastest bullet is 1,800 miles an hour. They say that the moon is orbiting us at 2,300 miles an hour. Okay. But the sun, you know, is, is not orbiting us is what they say. Okay. So we got to understand now the Bible says this in Joshua 10, Verses 12 through 13, then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, son, stand thou still upon Gibeon and thou moon in the valley of Ajan. And the sun stood still and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is it not so? Is it not written this written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hath not go down about a whole day. If you do go to the book of Jasher, it actually speaks of this exactly, right? So Joshua is referring to the book of Jasher, which is which is a extra biblical text, right? Um, so we have that. Now, if your explanation for this is that the the earth stopped moving and the and the moon would would uh so that what would have to happen here is the earth would have to stop moving. And this and the moon would have to stop if, if if you do the scientific method of this. And if you guys believe Neil Tyson DeGrasse, like you know, one of their Freemason gods, then he says if the earth stopped and you are not like attached to the earth or seat belted to the earth, then everybody would fly off the earth. Okay. So this is something that um if you're still believing in science, they said that that's impossible. So the Bible says that the moon and the sun stopped in two geographical locations, right? So I think that's really interesting. Um, there's a few more verses. I don't know if you have any more, Matt, but we have Habakkuk 3.11. The sun and the moon stood still in their habitation at the light of thine arrows, and they went at the shining of thy glittering spear. So we have Habakkuk. So we got two different verses speaking of that. And then a third verse. Uh, actually, I could go over four verses, but the third one is uh, Isaiah 38, verses 7 through 8. And this is the sign to you from the Lord, and the Lord will, will do this thing which he has spoken. Behold, I will bring the shadow of the sundial, which has gone down with the sun on the sundial of Ahaz, 10 degrees backwards. So the sun returned 10 degrees on the dial, which it had, had gone down. Now, like I said, when it goes down, it means going away from you in the Hebrew. So Matt, do you have anything else on that? I have one more verse to go over. Yeah, sure. I was just going to say, you know, I, I believe like 70 times in the Bible, it talks about the sun, moon, and stars is moving and, and does not talk about the earth moving. You're exactly right. One of the big proofs in Joshua is that when the sun stopped or you know, it wasn't just the sun that stopped. It was also the moon that stopped. The moon is not tied to the earth sun relationship, right? So 
it's very interesting. And it's just another proof that when God stopped the sun and the moon over specific locations, he wasn't just stopping the earth because had he just stopped the earth, only the sun would have stopped, right? The moon would have theoretically kept going. And, and you mentioned, uh, if, you, if I wanted to talk about a couple other things, but go on and, and mention your other verse. My other verse is, uh, something that a lot of flat earthers do bring up. It's, uh, what is on, um, Wonder Von Braun's tombstone, which Jason brought up, uh, Psalms 19 and 1, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Now, I think what he was doing is leaving a, leaving us some breadcrumbs to read the whole entire verse. So if you go to Psalms 19, 1 through 6, right, it says the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day utter his speech, the night unto the night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoice as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of heaven, which there's ends of heaven, right? And his circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. So what he's talking about in this verse is the sun moving and doing a circuit. So if you do a race, you start at one point and you end in another, right? So that's the tabernacle for the sun. So it's running a race. So the sun is moving, right? So I think this is very interesting. And it talks about his fourth is going to the end of the heaven. So if you look at what science says, it's talking about an, a universe that's ever expanding. There's no ends to this heaven. But when you talk about, because in this in this particular verse, he's talking about the heaven where the sun and the moon and the stars are located, right? And the sun is moving. Uh, I think I think Dave was touched on this every time that that the the sun will change its course from a because uh, I grow I grow plants. And I, I I'm a green thumb. I love growing plants in my backyard. And when during the winter time. The spot where I, I I grow my plants that you know get sun during the summer they get sun all summer long, but then once like around maybe September October the sun changes its course in that every part where that used to get sun now gets shade. Now if the Earth was changing its course like that, like it's spinning its rotation, it would have to cock maybe. Well, the, the the to the scale size, thousands of mi- like maybe hundreds of thousands of maybe a thousand miles or something like that to a different spot. That's that would be devastating to our planet. It would it, like you said, people. It would probably cause massive earthquakes, massive uh, 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 tidal waves and stuff like that. But it doesn't do that because the sun changes its course. So when you, I, I could I could sit there and 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 do this and do like a time lapse and, and try to show you, but it's weird. It really does change its course. And my wife even said, she goes, oh my God, you're right. It does do that. So one spot will get sun for six months. And then the rest of the year, it doesn't get sun on that spot. So why does it do that? Because the sun is changing its course, not the, not the earth, not nowhere else. So that means it's rotating around us, not rotating or we're not rotating. Around. Like you said, it goes away. It's weird. When, when, when I first saw that, that video they did of the sun going away, that is trippy. Like you start to see like, whoa, when you slow it down, you're like, oh my gosh, it does look like it's going away, not going. It's, it's weird. It's, it's hard to, it's hard to explain it, but it's, it's, it's once you see it, you can't see it. You're like, oh man, that's, that's something I cannot, I don't, I don't like this sure. again because it's like tripping you out. Cause you don't, you, you've been taught your whole life that this is that, and that is this. And when you start to sun see things, you're like, man, I don't believe anything anymore. I don't believe anything they tell you until I study it and then, you know, like come up with your own, your own belief, you know, like if you really want to, Matt, what do you, what do you, do you, do you agree with this is because I've seen that I've seen on a day <laughs> show that can do that. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, something else that is problematic in relation to that is that science tells us that we're actually further away from the sun in the winter. And we're actually, or excuse me, we're further away from the sun in the summer and we're closer to the sun in the winter Yet, you know, you think of, you know, the sun is supposed to be this flaming fireball, right? And you think, well, when do I get warmer when I'm standing next to a fire, when I'm closer to it, when I'm further away? Well, obviously, when you're closer to it and the flat earth model, it would say that the sun is actually closer during our summer and further away in our winter. And 
and it's that angle that is not reaching your plants anymore in the winter. And, and Josh brought up, you know, where heaven meets earth, the ends of heaven and the ends of the earth. Well, I think that's the same place. I think the ends of heaven and the ends of the earth are where they, where they come together in Antarctica. And that's, in my opinion, what Warner Von Braun's tombstone talking about Psalm 19 one is referring to. It's talking about, the firmament that they found in Antarctica during Operation Deep Freeze and, and something that's really cool kind of uh, just piece that I've put together is that uh, Walt Disney is actually an honorary member of Operation Deep Freeze and it's because Disney Studios filmed it and this is like in the 1950s I believe and if you look at the Disney logo it is a castle with a firmament that goes over the top and the really crazy thing is that there, there is a tower that goes above that firmament. So it's kind of like a nod to Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel, whose top, whose top would reach into heaven. So not only is he showing you the firmament, he's also showing you what side he aligns with, with uh, Nimrod and trying to create this, um, uh, you know, way, yeah, power, that power exactly, to try to dethrone God. And... You know, we mentioned Jesus and, you know, a lot of Christians will say, well, we just, you know, we need to focus on Jesus. And I get that. Uh, but Jesus had the same cosmology. So we already talked about Matthew 24. where he talked about the moon giving off its own light. He also talks in the book of Luke about the Pharisees, how they can discern the face of the sky and the earth but they can't discern the time in which they live. And so what he's saying is like, you guys understand the cosmology of this place but you can't understand the urgency of the day in which you live. And so even Jesus in multiple places in the new Testament, uh, who, who was there at creation, by the way, Colossians one, uh, Colossians one, Hebrews one, and John one. And then also in, uh, Ephesians, it talks about how Jesus was literally there at the creation or, or it says he created, or all things were created through him. So Jesus is well aware of, yeah. of the creation. So, and, and I buy him and for him and through him. Yeah. Yes. In first yes. 15, yes. Yep. And you mentioned Job and, and the imagery that God uses when he describes his creation. And I just don't think God would use imagery, the complete opposite of what he actually created. Right. Like, like God wouldn't create a spinning ball flying through space and then give us flat earth, motionless, fixed and movable imagery. <laughs> right. He just, he just wouldn't do that. And, you know, there's two characteristics of a spinning ball, right? It's motion and it's curvature. And time and time again, we've been unable to prove motion. And we can go into that if you want. And time and time again, we we see too far. You know, the, there is missing curvature, missing motion. And so how could you have a spinning ball? Yep. And and I'll, I'll just to touch on the Antarctica thing. I think this Proverbs 8, 27 through 29 uh, just kind of shows us that there is boundaries of the sea. It says, when he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle upon the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above. Okay, first of all, guys, firm means hard, solid. So this, this is talking about the skies being solid. And then it says, when the fountains and the springs of the deep became fixed and strong, when he set the sea its boundaries so that the waters would not transgress, uh, the boundaries set by his command when he marked out the foundations of the earth. So the sea has its boundaries. And Matt kind of touched upon that. The sea's boundaries would be Antarctica, right? And this and this ice around what you can see uh, on the UN map. Uh, right here, he's talking about the skies being firm. That's another, I mean, guys, firm does not mean uh, gases, does not mean uh, atmosphere. I mean, it's talking about it being firm, solid rakia like you said is solid uh beaten out bowl shaped right uh it's this definitely the hebrews the israelites believed in a uh solid dome being above us okay but i just i just love that verse because it lays it out that there's a firm sky and that the sea has its boundaries so that the waters cannot transgress so it's like a big pond like dave weiss would, would call it right the oceans so yeah and something else to in addition to that is I saw this on one of Dean O'Dell's videos, but there there's talk and maybe Isaiah, I can't remember exactly where it is, but it talks about how at the edge or at, you know, um, where these things are bounded and it may be just further down from where you read, it talks about the, the waters being calm there. And Antarctica is one of the only shorelines where 
there's no waves. If you've ever seen Antarctica, it is not like a normal beach or whatever. Like it is calm waters, whereas every other uh, beach that you would go to or shoreline that you would go to, you'd have water crashing up against things. It's it's eerily calm there. Mm, very interesting. So we have that. So, and then also I would like to ask you, which I, I'm pretty sure I already know the answer. This is rhetorical, but where would you say heaven is located? You know, do you, do you have a location for heaven? Now I ask uh, people that come on here that do believe in the globe, believe in space, believe in that. And everybody would tell me, this is the answer that I get most of the time is that heaven is in another dimension. Right. And I ask them, well, what's the Hebrew word for dimension? They don't have it. Where's hell located? It's in the earth in another dimension. So where would you say that heaven is located, Matt? And, um, you know, do you have some verses to back up where you believe? If not, I have the verses right here. So where would Great. you say heaven is located? <laughs> Great. So up is the short answer, right? Yes. I think, I think that heaven is above the firmament and above the waters. Or the waters are part of, part of heaven. I'm not, not sure exactly. But I do believe that God resides in the sides of the north. I think God in his throne room sits directly above the North Pole, which would be the center of of the flat earth. And like I said, I forget uh, which verse it was, but it talks about God residing in the sides of the North. Uh -huh. And something very, very interesting about that is in revelation, when John goes into the throne room and, and sees the throne of God, he talks about the Emerald rainbow in revelation four, three emanating from the throne of God. And the cool thing about the Northern lights, man, is they're green. They're like an Emerald, right? So yep. the closer you get to the North pole, the easier it is to see these these emanating green emerald rainbow, which is what John was describing. I used to live in northern Canada around the 55th parallel, and you could see the northern lights every once in a while. But it's it's quite a different experience looking at the northern lights, thinking, man, I am closer to the throne of God, closer to the spot where God can sit above and see his entire creation. So up above the firmament and close to the North Pole, though I though I think it, it spans all the way down to, to Antarctica. Yes. All right. There we go. So we got Ezekiel eight, verse three. He stretched out the form of a hand and took me by a lock of my hair. This is Ezekiel talking. And the spirit lifted me up between earth and heaven. So what is he saying there? He's saying that God's throne is, is, is heaven and, and between heaven and earth is where he's getting lifted up. Right. And he brought me in visions to, to God of Jerusalem to the door of the north gate of the inner court, which the seat of the image of jealousy was, which provokes to jealousy. So that's talking about uh, the north gate, like him getting in. So there's something I like to explain uh, is, is Ezekiel also talks about, and above the firmament, this is Ezekiel 126, and above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of sapphire stone. Understand, guys, that sapphire could be every color but red. Okay, so sapphire could be green. You know, we don't we don't know. So uh, the and sapphire is spoken about a lot, actually. And the, upon the likeness of a throne was the likeness of the appearance of a man above upon it. So he's talking about looking through the firmament and seeing God's throne. Right. We have that. Um, and also another verse that he talks about this is um, Ezekiel 10, 1. And then I looked and behold, in the firmament was the above the head. Uh, above the head of the cherubims, there appeared over them as it as it were a sapphire stone, as the appearance and likeness of a throne. Um, and the book of Daniel, when he's talking about praying the twenty one day fast, and he's talking about praying, the 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 angels talks about going through a spiritual battle just to make it to to here. So I believe in between uh, the where the sky is and, and where heaven would be where the moon, sun, and the stars are is where the angels and fallen angels battle for them to actually come and answer prayers. That's what he talks about. Daniel speaks of this, right? So I think that's interesting. Um, another thing is Amos nine, six is another one. This is in the NASB 2020. I don't really read that version. I'd have to go through it, but they kind of have a very, very good interpretation of Amos nine, six. The one, speaking of God, who builds his upper chambers in the heavens and has founded his vaulted dome over the earth. He who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them onto the face of the earth. And the Lord is his name. Right. We have that. And uh, I have another one where it's talking about uh, God's. Uh, so Psalms 150, one through two. Praise ye Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him in the mighty acts. Praise him according to the excellent greatness. 
Um, and then in Revelation, uh, we get it is also it talks about uh, when it's talking about the 24 elders is talking about hearing the sound of thunder and the sound of waters. Why? Because there's water in heaven, right? And that's what's below the, the firmament. I mean, above the firmament is waters, right? So I think there's a few. I don't know if you have any more that you want to go over about that. Yeah, I was just going to say Isaiah 14, 13, he's talking about Lucifer saying that he wants to basically dethrone God. And it says, yeah. for thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Yes. And uh, he says that uh, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Right. So that means that God's throne is above the stars. And what's below, what's above the stars, the firmament, what's above the firmament, water, what's above that, God's throne. And it does talk about the north. So, uh, you know, Satan is a flat earther too. So anyways, I'm uh, <laughs> no, just kidding. So we have, uh, we have that. And then uh, let's see, thou hast spread. Yeah. So we had, we already talked about Job uh, 38 or 37, 18. It says, hast thou him spread out the sky, which is strong as a molten, a looking glass. Uh, the tower of Babel, you brought that up, Matt. Um, so what would be the problem with a tower being built up to heaven if we were, uh, you know, a, a spinning ball going through space, there would be no problem. But what they wanted to do is they wanted to build a tower to go and try to kill God, the most high. Right. And that's another thing the most high. Why do people, why does Isaiah refer to God as the most high? Why in Luke does the angel call God the highest? Because the most high he's in the highest part of creation which would be above the firmament his throne everything is below him and even uh the devil says that he wants to be like the most high you know what i mean like him not above him or better than him because you can't be right that that's yeah, interesting that, yeah it's exactly right the the most high is something i never never really thought about i think that's a really good revelation you talk about satan being a flat earther you know it was satan that took jesus up onto the high mountain showed him all the kingdoms of the earth which would not be possible on a ball. Yes. And the, and the, the verse that I was referring to is Luke uh, 1, verses 28 to 32. It says, And the angel came unto her and said, Hail that are highly favored, and the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Talking about Mary. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind the manner of solution that should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God, and behold, thou shalt conceive in the womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call him name is named Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. Right, and the Lord God shall give unto them the throne of of, of his father David. So, the of the highest is what the angels referring to God as. Now we're not talking about in like highest as in like the highest ranking. They're talking about the literal highest, and that's why Isaiah I think does say the most high. Very interesting. Um, firmament. Uh, let's let's talk about Operation Fishbowl. That's something a lot of people bring up. So Operation Fishbowl, the original name was Dominique Chama. Operation Fishbowl was a series of high altitude nuclear tests in 1962 that were carried out by the United States as a part of a larger Operation Dominique Chama. Uh, so Dominique, right, guys, look it up. In Latin, it means belonging to the Lord, right? Chama is fixed shell. So if you think about it, it's Operation Fixed shell belonging to the Lord, right? And what do they do? They're taking Thor missiles and other names for the missiles as well. But those, uh, you know, in particular, Thor missiles, which would be like Thor's hammer trying to break the firmament. Okay. Definitely do some studies on that, guys, if you want to look into it. Um, any Anything else on that on Do Op Operation Fishbowl? Yeah, I don't see any other reason why military would want to explode, you know, thermonuclear weapons in our atmosphere unless they were testing the height of something and it's thought that they were testing the height of the dome in that case or trying to blow a hole in it which again is is a little bit crazy and it sounds a lot like the tower of babel when they were trying to essentially build a tower and then go in and attack uh, the most high as we said and yes fishbowl of the lord you know we we think this thing is essentially uh, an inverted fishbowl right yeah and uh, there's a lot of uh, people right now that are talking about extra land. That's something that's that's very interesting. Um, I'm not 100% on that because I, I believe that God said he created, you know, a greater light to rule the day, lesser light to rule the night. So I'm not seeing the sun going past 
you know, Antarctica, but who knows? I don't know, man. All they, they, they're, they're all doing their own studies and who knows what's up with that. But the, the, that stuff's super fascinating to me. I'm like you, I kind of think Antarctica is it. The only way I could see that working is if, you know, the Bible talks about ages and the only way in my mind that could work is if these ages are constantly working themselves outward. And if the garden of Eden was at the North Pole that essentially says that creation started at the center and started to work its way out. And then when that one became too evil, uh, God essentially created another one and it's starting to work its way out. And so that's what creates these rings. I suppose it could be possible. I don't think it's biblical. Um, in fact, I've seen a lot of compelling evidence that the, the Garden of Eden is actually in Florida, that that is the Fertile Crescent. It's a pretty amazing study. There's like uh, 27, 27 of the 28 trees named in Genesis are found in Florida. The only place in the world where you can find gopher wood that Noah made the ark out of is in Florida. The only place where there's a four mouth river is in Florida, uh, near Arkansas, you know, the Arkansas river huh. wow. it's, and then there's a lot of crazy stuff with the names, but, uh, again, it's, it's all fun to talk about. It's all, but it's all, you know, speculation, obviously. <laughs> yeah. Definitely speculation. So, and then uh, as far as how many heavens there are, I, I believe biblically, I know that there's extra biblical text that might uh, refer to it. it's. I believe that Paul is talking about three heavens, right? So it talks about Second uh, Corinthians twelve verses two through four. I knew a man in Christ above fourteen years ago. Whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven, and I knew such a man. Whether in the body, out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. And how, and how he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for man to utter. So if you hear Paul talking about that, they talk about getting caught up to the third heaven. Now, I don't hear Paul talking about traveling through uh, galaxies and, and through different stars, dodging planets and all this stuff. I think he probably would have wrote a few books on that alone, that travel that he made. But what he's talking about is going up, first of all, and where is up on the globe? You know, we don't know because it keeps rotating and spinning. We don't know where up and down was, but he talks about going up to the third heaven. So um, caught up to paradise, right? So all he's saying is that he that he he has uh, he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. He doesn't talk about traveling so far. And then you know, also we talked about the firmament. Something I was talking about is is God's throne is above the firmament. If now if you take the the Genesis account and you put the firmament in a, uh, in a universe that we're talking about. So God's throne would be constantly moving away from the earth. You know, that's what science is doing. They're bringing you further and further away from God. Right. So definitely interesting that's, stuff. That's amazing imagery there. Like, absolutely. That's exactly what, uh, science is trying to do. Yeah. And, um, so we have that. How many heavens do you believe? I mean, I know there's extra biblical text that maybe talks about seven heavens and there's different planets in each firmament. I mean, I, I believe there's only one firmament and three yeah, heavens. yeah. I think, I mean, I believe that you could technically get three. I think you could say the, the heavens that the, the birds fly in and maybe the heavens that the, the stars are and then the heaven where God is possibly, or maybe there's a heaven and then the, and then a highest heaven where, where God's throne is. I, doesn't really um, doesn't really make a difference to me, I suppose, unless for some reason uh, someone wants to create, you know, extra heavens that aren't that aren't biblical. Then then it'd be an issue. But yeah, yeah. I'm just not sure. So God calls the firmament heaven, right? So which mm -hmm. I used to always I explained it exactly how you explained it, Matt. Usually, and then um, I kind of I was watching a video that my my buddy put out, and I was like, okay, so God calls the firmament heaven, which I didn't catch. So we could say where the moon, sun, and the stars are is one heaven and, and, the, and the sky. And then we could say that the firmament is a heaven. And then we can also say that God's throne where he's located is, is a heaven. That's one way to look at it. Or the way you explained it as well. I used to always explain it. Um, another thing that we need to understand is when Jesus well, I, was- I can, I can do my Jordan Peterson and say, well, I suppose it depends what the definition of heaven is. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> For sure. So when, when Jesus was baptized by John, oh, Jason, do you want to add anything, bro? I'm sorry, man. I'm just going, I got so many verses for this. Go ahead. You're good. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we have, uh, when Jesus is baptized by John the Baptist, um, there was a voice from heaven, right? Matthew three sixteen, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straight away out of the water and lo, the heavens were open unto him. And he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove 
and lightning upon him, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Also in 2 Peter 1.17, For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, the voice was born to him by the majestic glory, This is my beloved Son, who I am well pleased. So God is close, right? If he was trillions upon trillions upon trillions of light years away, which is where you'd have to be in this expanding, ever expanding universe, then, um, you, you know, how are you going to hear God's voice being right there? He is close by, like Isaiah talks about, you know, uh, he's looking down at us like grasshoppers, right? So that, that was I think that's an amazing. I think it's an amazing comment. It's like you ask someone to go out and say, stare at the horizon. Do you see a curve? No. Do you feel motion? No. Do you feel like God is far away or close? A Christian is going to tell you, I feel like he's close. People need to succumb to their senses, right? It's We should be trusting our senses and we should be trusting the Bible over what we see in textbooks and on screens. Like, exactly. God, God is close. <laughs> Agreed. Yes. And then um, the, the verse I was speaking of is Isaiah 40, 22 through 21. Uh, 21 through 22 have you not known have you not heard has it not been told to you from the beginning have you not understood from the foundations of the earth which i believe happened in genesis 1 1 it is he who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in if you look at what the tents were like back for the hebrews it was a dome right it says he stretches out the heavens like a curtain so that's very interesting. And also he he sits above us, like uh, above the circle of the earth. Uh, just like, you know, a lot of people have talked about Isaiah 40 or 22, 18. He says, he talks about tossing thee like a ball. So there's a difference between a ball and a circle. You guys can look into that if you want to get into that, you know, and he was also watching us over us like grasshoppers. One analogy I like to say is that you know when your boss walks in the room, you, you start looking like you're busy, right? So you're basically yeah, you know that you're vacuuming being, the grass. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you know that you're being watched. So if we knew that God was closer, watching us like grasshoppers, like he, he knows our every move, anyways, because he's omnipresent. But I'm just saying, you know, you get this feeling where you'd be probably uh it would help you to maybe sin less right not be sinless because that's very tough but sin less you know there's some stuff that uh i think god being close to us uh is is very uh also everything we're speaking about also what it does that it makes humans special and it makes it you know god basically making this habitation realm whatever you want to call it for us you know we breathe in oxygen breathe out carbon dioxide the trees breathe in carbon dioxide uh, uh, and breathe out oxygen. So it's like it, this, it, you know, the water cycle, all these things could work with a closed system. Okay. We don't need all this other, you know, crazy stuff happening. And, and uh, like you said, um, you said that uh, if you just use your senses, you would see that we are fixed and immovable, you know, and that the sun is moving away from us. The moon doesn't look like it's moving uh, faster than a bullet. It doesn't feel like we're traveling 30 times faster than a bullet orbiting the sun and spinning at half the speed of a bullet, right? A thousand miles mm -hmm. an hour. You come to your senses. Um, another one I like to go over is um, every eye will see. So Revelation 1, 7 through 8, behold, he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him and all kindreds the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen, I'm the Alpha Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. So we have him coming in. Can you imagine if he was on a cloud coming from way like uh, trillions upon trillions of light years away, um, you know, trying to make it to the earth as it's spinning and rotating? And, and you know, what it's saying is basically... Um, it says that God's going to peel back the heavens like a scroll. So I believe he opens up the firmament. Jesus comes through on the cloud, right? Uh, it talks about stars falling from heaven. That's something that people need to understand. Revelation 6, 13, and the stars of heaven fell onto the earth as a fig tree cast their untimely figs and the heaven departed as a scroll. It doesn't say the heavens. It talks about the heaven. Remember in Genesis, uh, uh, one six, it talks about the firmament being heaven, like I just spoke about. It looks like God says he opens the heavens like a scroll, and then Jesus comes through. So any comment on that? And every eye will yeah, see. Like, 
man, you, you bring up so many good points and it's all those points combined that now it kind of gives me the attitude of, you know, uh, someone brings me someone and say, Hey Matt, talk to this guy about flat earth. And usually my first response is like, look, I've never seen the curve. I've never felt the motion. You've never seen the curve. You've never felt the motion, but I'm supposed to sit here and explain to you why the earth is flat and motionless. No, I'm not going to do that. And so it kind of puts, puts them on the defensive, but you know, you talked about the, uh, the tents back then and, wow. and how, you know, peeling back the, the sky, like a scroll could, could be a reference, you know, also kind of that tent imagery. And, and you're right. Like I think about some of the stuff I saw, uh, back in the day, I think it was like Project 313 or something like that, about how the the temple, the tabernacle, was not a rectangular shaped deal. That it was, if you take all the materials that's listed out in the Old Testament, that it actually works perfectly for a domed shaped tent with a hole in the top so that God can uh, <laughs> you know, see down into it, right? Just like you were talking about before. Uh, I believe it's like Project 313. I can't remember, but a fascinating study about how one, the, the tabernacle was actually circular, uh, like Isaiah 40, 22, and that it was a dome shaped tent and that the, the tribes sat outside of it in four different directions, which actually makes the shape of a cross with God's tabernacle and the Holy of Holies right in the center. And you break up Isaiah 40, 22, that's like, some Christians favorite verse to bring up and say, look, he's the, uh, Isaiah says circle, right? So the Bible, it does talk about a globe and you're like, well, no, we believe in a circle. Also it, the earth is round and flat like a pizza, but mm-hmm. Isaiah also used the word for ball in 2218, but not when describing the earth, when describing the earth, he used the word circle, which is different than a ball. And then Christians, other favorite verse to bring up is Job 26, seven, where it says that he hangs the earth on nothing. Well, that's true. He does not hang the earth on anything. It's set on pillars and on a foundation, just like it says later in that book, Job, the exact book, God wouldn't contradict himself. And by the way, those are God's words, not Job's. So we can't say that that Job was just describing the world that he's used to picturing. No, no, that was actually God talking. So I meant to that. And uh, we also have the flood that, that are, you know, Genesis 7, 11, um, it's, it's talking about three separate events. You know, it's talking about um, the fountains of the great deep were broken, right? It talks about the windows of heaven were open, which I believe he's talking about the firmament being open and the waters coming in. So if you have a a circle and you have Antarctica and Mount Everest is the highest point, but, you know, we have Antarctica. All you have to do to flood the entire earth is fill up this fishbowl. And as long as it gets higher than Mount Everest, then you you know the flood works, but on the ball it's crazy. But the, the the interesting thing is in church, I hear a lot of pastors say that the, it rained for forty days and forty nights, and that's how the earth flooded. But here I'm seeing three separate events. I'm seeing the fountains of the great deep were broken up, so water's coming from the bottom. I'm seeing that the heavens were open, right? The windows of heaven were open, so the firmament was open, and then also it rained for forty days and forty nights. So I'm seeing three separate events there. Just want to put that in there. Any yeah. Thoughts on that? Yeah. So to me, in my mind, there's no possible way that rain for 40 days could flood the earth to the point of water going over Mount Everest. If you can picture what we believe as the earth, let's take let's take a like a piece of Tupperware, a piece of clear Tupperware. We're going to turn it upside down and we're going to put it in a bathtub. All right. So let's fill the bathtub with water. These are the waters uh, below and the waters above. And we're going to submerge that bowl down into the bathtub. And so you've got this pocket of air inside this bowl. You've got this atmosphere, this tight atmosphere. Well, if we open up a window in heaven, if we open up the windows in heaven, what's going to happen to the water underneath? It's going to start to rise, right? Because you're letting that pressure out. You open up the windows of heaven and the fountains of the deep burst forth, right? So Mm -hmm. that's how it happened was God let out pressure in the system by opening up a window and then that water started to rise from underneath. Yes, it rained from above, but as you said, and and as I agree, I don't think you can flood the whole earth with rain and you definitely can't do it with a, an ice canopy that breaks forth, you know, yeah. from an asteroid or whatever, whatever the explanation is. So I think once again, just like everything else, the, not just the biblical explanation, but the flat earth biblical explanation of the flood is by far the most logical. 
Yes. And like I said, three separate events. When you go to church, you're not going to hear those three separated into the threes because they don't know how to explain the earth. That's a very astute uh, observation. So we have that. Earth is also a footstool. That's in Isaiah 66 1. Uh, Thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye build unto me and where the place of my rest? So we have that. Um, any any other verses that we could go through would be like, um, we talked about up. Enoch went up to heaven. Elijah went up to heaven. Jesus ascended up to heaven. Jesus descended into the earth. Hell is located down, which is in the earth. I don't know what up and down is on these, this spinning globe. I have no clue, you know, where up would be. And if it's going up to heaven, they would have to wait until the rotation of the earth comes and then it can go up. But, you know, basically there's an up, there's a down on, I'm not saying that the earth is this flat, but there's an up and down here, right? There's an up, and there's a down, but on the globe spinning, there's no up or down there. So very interesting the way the word is just used. Um, and then there's- yeah. Just to, just to elaborate on that, you know, that you'd have to time your ascent to heaven, kind of like NASA has to time its missions, right? But isn't it interesting how it's always easier to go down than up in any form or fashion? It's harder to go up. It's harder to live a life that has accountability, right? Like, um, not that it's hard to get into heaven because that's that's a very simple decision. But in this world, in in this uh, world that's controlled by you know Satan and the uh, you know the stuff that he's pulled over our eyes. It's harder to live a life ascending than it is descending. Just like it's harder to jump off a cliff and go up, it's way easier to jump off a cliff and go down. Right? Yes, very true. And 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 Jesus uh, was tempted with that too to jump off a cliff and go down. Right? Yeah. So that's a very interesting observation as well. So, um, and. Uh, I always like to end it with uh, some of Rob Skiba's uh, information and some of other, some other guys where you were talking about the six, 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 you know, we got the uh, uh, every one mile is eight inches squared. So if you look up eight divided by 12, it's 0.66 of a foot. So as you go 10 miles, it's 6.66 of a foot, hundred miles is 666.6 of a foot. We got the 66,600 miles around, uh, around the sun that we're orbiting. We got the, the Earth's circumference is 600 times 6 times 6 nautical miles. We have the uh, Isaac Newton. He first started writing the theory of gravity in 1666. Uh, the force of gravity on Earth is 666 Newtons. I don't know what a Newton is. I know what a fig Newton is, but not a Newton. Uh, speed uh, of uh, the speed of sound is equal to 666 knots. The diameter of the moon is 6 times 6 times 60, which comes out to 2160. The distance to the moon is 6 times 60 times 666 miles, which is uh, you know comes out to like 232,000 miles, something like that. The Arctic and Antarctic celestial sphere is 66.6 degrees north latitude, 66.6 degrees south latitude. And the surface of the temperature of Uranus, not my anus, is negative 6 times 6 times 6 degrees. That's and there's more to it too. That's just what I have written down, right? Uh, so. That was funny. Was <laughs> so we have drop that. that one in there. And drop that in there real quick. <laughs> so, Not mine. Is, that was a good one. So that was funny. all Sorry, that, man. all that stuff <laughs> combined. You know, I believe that personally. I believe that the strong delusion. I know it's referring to the Antichrist. I believe it's the beast <laughs> system. The strong delusion in Second uh, Thessalonians two eleven. I think that all this stuff is part of the strong delusion, the great delusion, right? Because. Uh, you know, you got the evolution, you got the, you got the big bang, you got the heliocentric model. You have all this stuff that makes you not believe, you know, believe man over God, you know, strong delusion, the beast system. I think it's all part of it. NASA, Disney, all these different lies, everything combined, I believe is a strong delusion. And in the end, everyone's talking about an alien invasion could happen. Um, also the, the last verse I'd like to go over before we end the podcast, before I let Matt and Jason end is Genesis two verses one through four. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And the seventh day ended his work, which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. So God says that it is finished. Okay. The heavens and the earth are finished, but you know, in the end, we have revelation where God's creating a new heaven and a new earth, and there's going to be no sun, right? But why would God need to create a new heaven and a new earth if the earth and the heaven were not connected? 
All right. If you have the earth and he can create a new earth, no problem. And the heavens would be trillions upon trillions of miles away. So it wouldn't matter. But what does he do? He creates a new heaven and a new earth because earth and heaven are connected. And in Revelation, it talks about heaven coming down to the earth and God being the light with no sun. Think about that, guys. Think about that. Explain that in a way that you can explain it uh, to not mean that they are connected. But uh, uh, any last words, uh, Matt, before we get yeah. on? Yeah, that's, that's a really good revelation. I think it ties right in what I said earlier about the ends of earth and the ends of heaven are the same place because it's where it's where heaven and earth meet. And you talk about the, the strong delusion, and, and I'm with you. I do believe the strong delusion refers to the the culmination of, of all of this, the what the devil has pulled over our eyes in order to uh, try to make it seem to us that that God doesn't exist or that Jesus what didn't die and was resurrected. But it is interesting that that word delusion is the word plane, which is the root word for the word planet, right? It's it's I I do, you know God's a creator, he's an artist, so I think he can be artistic in the way that. Uh, he allows certain things to be named and things like that. And uh, we started this off talking about Romans one and Jason, you know, uh, talking about what a rich book Romans is. And and Romans one is maybe the richest, you know, uh, of, of not just things that are bad, but how you can get in trouble for not speaking up when you know, things are bad or when you know, things are a lie. And, and we're talking about truth here, but ultimately we're talking about the truth, right? The truth, which would be Christ and the gospel. And and it was understanding that that what the Bible says is true and what the Bible says actually happened that, that changed my life. The fact that the, the writers of the New Testament, they call themselves eyewitnesses. They talk about things that they've seen and they've heard. So they're, they're not even asking us to believe what they believe. They're asking us to believe what they saw. It's totally different. We're not, we're not going on faith. We're saying, yeah, these guys wrote down an account. These things actually happened. And if you look up the manuscript evidence for the Bible, it's, it's undeniable. It's provable that the Bible is the most accurate and reliable collection of books in the history of the world. And, and that is what we've decided to base our, our truth on this, this flat earth thing. It's awesome. Um, but it's not as important as, as Jesus right Amen. now. Now I can say that uh, flat Earth or or biblical cosmology um, is something that can save a person because me in my twenties I didn't believe the Bible because of the spinning ball heliocentric uh, ever expanding universe and it was that science perspective that kept me from believing the Bible kept me from reading page one of the Bible because page one is the total opposite if the devil can make me believe that page one is a lie why would I go on to read page two. So Christians, get out of the way if you don't agree with our biblical cosmology. Get out of the way because it can save some people. Stop saying it's ridiculous just because you don't believe it. We are simply taking a literal view of what the Bible says. Josh and Jason have laid out perfectly what the Bible says here with verse after verse after verse. You know, there's not one verse that that defines the Trinity doctrine. Okay. It's many verses. So there's not one verse that defines this flat earth doctrine. It's many, it's over 200 actually. And, and so what we've done is we've combed the Bible. We've also looked at the ball, by the way, we've looked at the spinning ball model. We've looked at the science. That's one reason that that's one thing that led us to looking into this, to question this. Yes. We understand that there are explanations to try and make this look stupid. Yes. We've looked at them. We'd be idiots to just take something as crazy sounding as flat earth and just take it at face value and run with it. All right. You guys know, Josh, you know, Jason, they're not idiots. And, and, and hopefully I've, I've shown you that I am not also not an idiot. So, <laughs> so look past that, look past the world, look past textbooks, look past the images that we see on screens and man, just rest on your senses and the Bible because the Bible's proven the Bible's never changed. And, and that's what will ultimately lead you to truth. It's the discovery of flat earth that, may, that meant I was not fooled when COVID came around. It meant that I was not fooled when they told me, hey, you need to vaccinate your children. It's, it's led to so many things in my life where I'm no longer controlled. So I, I invite you guys, if you're listening, to really give it a whirl. And um, yeah, I do believe it will literally change your world.
Yeah, for sure. Jason, any last words before we go? Yeah, like like Matt says, whatever leads you to to Christ, whether it's flat, whether it's the Nephilim, whether it's like you said, page one of Genesis, whatever it does, if it leads you back to it leads you to God and leads you to the to the truth, I'm all for it. You know, it's that's 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 it's it's a uh, it's 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 hard to accept. Sorry, but it's 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 truth. Like it's very hard to accept when you are, you know, you learn so much a certain way your whole life, and then when you find out that it's like you said, it is is it has actually made me stand up for not like taking a vaccine or, or taking uh, certain things and and just being manipulated to be like, yeah, you got to do this just just to you know. You know your immune system isn't great. You know the, the, our 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 way is better. It'll, it'll it'll help you out. It's like no, God made us in a a way where we could fight off diseases and we could we could uh, our our bodies are immaculate things where they they do immaculate thing they do crazy and and awesome things for you. And God bless us with these with these bodies and these and these minds and to to study and show yourself approved and make sure that you're you know you know, rightly dividing this word and, and, and this word of truth and rightly doing it right. And if you're doing it right, you're going to get blessed and God's going to give you more truth. If you, if you, if he, he's going to give you more and more and more and see what you do with it. If you don't do what you're supposed to do with it, he's going to take it away. So like I said, the creation alone is enough to condemn any person, any non-believer. It doesn't matter. The creation alone is enough to condemn you. So if you don't believe in the creation, there's a lot of judgment coming your way. So, and, then, and there's a lot of judgment coming our way as well. So and get on it. Do your faith, diligence. Faith comes by hearing the word of God, right? So we're saved by grace through faith, you know, uh, for it is a gift from God, not of yourselves. So no man shall boast. So I say this, I'm not saying that if you don't believe in the flat earth, then, then you're not going to heaven. You know, obviously it's faith in Jesus, but the word of God, you know, faith comes by hearing, right? So as we're saying all these verses and, and if you're hearing it, but not believing it, and you're pushing something, you know, 70% of the Bible is true, but 30% is an allegory, poetry. I don't need to believe in that. We need to be believe in all the scripture because all the scripture is inspired by God. Um, Jesus says to be not of this world. What's going to happen? A constant battle between God and the devil. It started with Genesis 3.15, you know, trying to go, you know, thy seed when they're when they're going against each other, a cosmic battle. So we need to understand that everything we deal with is a spiritual battle, you know, uh, especially you know, the one, the devil, I believe is in control of these big, large delusions, you know, that, that we're going through and deceives. And I think that his demons do these little ones where you're like fighting in your head, you get these thoughts, but the devil's controlling these large schemes that are, that are, that are moving people into uh, ungodliness, into atheist, into uh, evolution, into big bang. And all this stuff is making people obviously move away from God. So what I like to tell all the flat earthers out there that are listening, like Matt was saying, and Jason saying, and you know, don't do not worship the creation, right? Worship the creator. I noticed that a lot of people just focus so much on flat earth on the creation that, that, that we need to understand that God is the one that created it. And we need to, we need to, fo you know, point people towards the creation. Yes. But point people towards the creator, towards God, towards Jesus, towards the answer, the way, the truth, the life. Okay. That's what I definitely want to say. It is very important. Matt, thank you for coming on our show, brother. I really appreciate you. Yes, thank you dude, for, for being awesome. a, a backbone for the Bible. Thank you for being a backbone for flat earth from a biblical perspective. You know, I, we appreciate you, you know, thank you. Heck yeah. Man, I I appreciate the opportunity. I love getting to meet you guys. I like you and I were talking about before the show, my, my channel, my Twitter, my YouTube has all been deleted, but I do have a new channel back up. It's at Matt son of Chris. I'm on YouTube, on Instagram, Telegram, and uh, Twitter. And then I also have a book. It's called the house that Jesus built. You can get that on Amazon it talks about the biblical shape of the earth. It also has a great chapter on the reliability of the scriptures. So it's uh man. Matt son of Chris. Yep. Okay. Uh you have to just if you could send it to me on on Instagram so that I could put it in the in the description. So guys, sure. yeah. He got deleted, okay? So he's telling the truth and he got deleted. So I want to say please guys if you guys could just subscribe to his channel and and if you want to go to his Telegram and all that, support him. Did you say something about a book, Matt? Yeah, I've got a book. It's called The House That Jesus Built. You can find it on Amazon. It's uh, if you search, you know, on Amazon, I'll send you a link to that too. But you just search Matt Long House That Jesus Built or Matt Long Flat Earth on Amazon and it'll pop right up.
All right. So guys, understand, please, he's doing this for free and he needs he's about to rebuild coming into the industry. We want him to come back strong. So please help him with that. And uh, like we always do, we're going to end this in prayer. So uh, Father God, in the name of Jesus, thank you so much for providing us with uh, your word. Uh, we would be so lost without it. Um, we appreciate you like giving us the ability to read, giving us a, the ability to comprehend uh, everything that we're saying here. We're just trying to go biblical, uh, you know, science, you know, that that's all a different section. This was all biblical. This is all your word. And we just want to know, we appreciate you giving us your word. Uh, we appreciate you using Moses and Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Paul and G, you know, all these different avenues that you, you, you taught us to, um, you know, to, to learn everything that we displayed today. Uh, I just want to say anybody that's listening, Lord, that is, you know, on the fence on, on, on worshiping you or, 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 you know, on the fence of reading their Bibles, if you could just push them over the edge supernaturally to start reading the Bible, getting into your word, finding out the rule, absolute truth, any conspiracy theorist that's listening right now, that's, that's just denying what we're saying, denying the Bible, deny, you know, please help them supernaturally to start, you know, at least pick up the Bible and read it, start and, uh, you know, start finding out who the true, uh, God is, you know, we appreciate everything you do and we love you in Jesus name. Amen. 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 Everybody that's listening, subscribe to Matt's channel. Please uh, subscribe to our channel. Please share our channel. You know, if you could, you know, obviously we're not we're not being pushed that that hard by by YouTube. We need to try to see if you guys can push it for us. You know, we appreciate you. God bless you, and thank you so much for tuning in.